the person who was in there was approximately sort of 20, maybe 27, 28 metres down, something like that, because I'd got a 30 metre rope, so I could throw them a rope to think about the basics to, to make them to make them safe and attach them onto the rope. But I had very little, very little left to, with which to effect a rescue and they were clearly stuck from what they were saying and they were injured. So. Welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine podcast with myself, Owen Walker and Lauren McKenna. So in this session, uh, we're speaking with James Thacker on mountain rescue in the Alps. So what we wanted to do is really dig into the fundamentals of mountain rescue with James and just look at um, how indeed James got involved in mountain rescue and indeed some of his anecdotal experience. So James Thacker is an IFM GA mountain guide, a member of the British Association of Mountain Guides and a mountaineer instructor, splitting his time between Chamonix in France and the Cairngorms in Scotland. So James' enthusiasm for working in the mountains has taken him to Arctic Greenland, the Himalayas, and the classic north face of the European Alps, as well as rock climbing around the world. So for 16 years, James was actively involved within mountain rescue in the Peak District as a member of the Derby MRT and DDL MRT. So with this casualty care experience, James has also developed an interest in the management of patients in the mountains and enrolled on an Orms Hazardous Environment Medical Technician course or HEMT course. And in recent years, he's also contributed to the wider agenda of mountain safety for the British Mountaineering Council. So if that wasn't enough, James is also a trustee of the Chris Walker Memorial Trust, which strives to fund and deliver in conjunction with, with the Scottish Avalanche Information Service, continuing professional development in training in avalanche awareness across the Scottish region. So James is also an observer and forecaster for the Scottish Avalanche Information Service. So James is also an observer and forecaster for the Scottish Avalanche Information Service and a member of the Applied Psychology and Human Factors Group, collaborating with Aberdeen University and various sectors of industry. Welcome to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast, James. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. That's, um, yeah, that's quite an, an intro, um, Owen. I kind of, yeah, barely recognise myself. <laughs> thanks very much. That's yeah, good to be, good to speak to you. Oh, listen, it's fantastic to have you on. So, James, I just wonder if we could start with you just giving us a short history of how you got involved within Mountain Rescue. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, and, and I suppose I should say that my experiences in Mountain Rescue now, you know, they seem like um, like years ago. Um, but they provided um, a base for, you know, what later became my my career in working in the outdoors in, in one way or another. Um and um, yeah, as I recall events, I joined Derby Mountain Rescue Team at the age of 15, um, which is you know, probably quite correctly, you, you couldn't do that now. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's a famous, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a famous mountaineering sort of area, Derby, isn't it? Um, you know, but it gave me the benefit of you know, starting to train well before jo joining the call out list and being sort of active um, with the team, which occurred a couple of years later. And like many people, you know, I was already a keen climber, even at that age, and I'd hitch or get the bus into the Peak District to climb with friends. And and I, really, I was probably lacking in a bit of imagination because it was a friend of mine, Jacob Grant, actually, that suggested um, we should join at the same time. So if he does end up listening to this, it is definitely his fault. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, there were some joint team training weekends that were arranged at the time, and I already knew some main members from neighbouring teams. So, in fact, I knew Ben Cooper, you know, who, who you'll know well, in part of the WEM um, sort of faculty. Um, when I went to the University of Sheffield, it... it you know, it seemed logical to join a local team, and that neighbouring team was Edale Mountain Rescue Team, Edale MRT. Um, and although I'm not active with Mountain Rescue now, the great thing about having those experiences is is that you know you can't really take them away. I sort of continue to benefit from my time with Derby and Edale, even now. I would say, 
Um, and you know, in Edale, I was a later. I was a, you know, I was a team member and and a, a deputy team leader, which gave me a slightly different perspective on the whole thing. Yeah. So you spoke a bit about your time with Edale and Derby uh, MRTs. What what did you learn, um, and what were some of the standard cases that you would see um, with your time with those um, MRTs? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I'll, um, I guess Derby and Edale, you know, as teams, they're quite different. So I'll just try and separate them a little bit in my in my answer, if that's okay. Um, Derby's quite a large team. So, you know, as I joked before, um, you know, many people don't really associate um, Derby with a, a, you know, a mountainous area. Um, and which is quite correct, you know, the, the south of the Peak Districts, you know, it's quite a rural, rural sort of location. Um, you know, as such, as a team, Derby was often called away from those sort of Derbyshire lowland areas to carry out, um, or sorry, I should say, you called from Derbyshire to lowland areas to carry out searches for people missing from home, you know, and, and they were very, very effective at that. Um, you know, for me to contribute that, as a relatively young person at, at the time, um, you know, I needed to learn to navigate to a high standard, not only to get from A to B, but to record, um, you, you know, the areas that we'd we'd sort of searched and our, our confidence of, you know, detecting people. And of course, this was before sort of GPS tracking and, and other electronic methods were um, widely used. So it was proper map and compass stuff. Um, we um, we also needed a bit of a skill set in missing person behaviour, and, and that was relatively new to the UK at the time. So we worked with police search advisors, uh, pollsters. Um, I'm not sure if they have the same name now. Um, you know, which was quite quite an interesting thing to do. In terms of medical care, these cases they often involved unconscious and um, hypothermic casualties who've been in the elements for some time. Um, but more frequently, they would involve uh, body recoveries, unfortunately. So we also needed a, a sound understanding, you know, ease, even as individual team members of the recognition of life extinct and, you know, securing evidence at the scene and, and those sort of other kind of wider um, issues. Um, so certainly the less glamorous side of mountain rescue, if there is one. Um, but even now, sort of I recognise still that um you, you know search is an emergency too and it's a really important part of what mountain rescue teams do um you know and there's there's teams that make a huge contribution across the country um along with lowland sar and you know coast guard rescue teams for missing you know missing people as well as those people who are injured but um yeah you know to bring a, a sort of a personal perspective to it you know i'd sometimes be concerned that um you know these searches you know would conclude they they kind of finish without a find or a, a sort of a recovery and, and i'd find that quite frustrating um but later i learned that there was huge value in being able to sort of you know confirm that somebody wasn't in that location they weren't there and, and that ultimately frees up resources to be used elsewhere or or drive kind of alternative lines of inquiry and and of course yeah you know there is value in that um, yeah, Derby, you know, again, as a team, it was quite a large team. So, you know, it would also be used to back up major searches elsewhere. And I was involved in, you know, a variety of things across, um, you know, the north of England, you know, including um, some murder inquiries, unfortunately, um, helicopter crashes, uh, ghost plane sightings. That was a little bit unusual. Um you know, to name a few. And, and when I joined in the mid nineties, the memories of uh, uh, Lockerbie, uh, Lockerbie air disaster, you know, uh, Pan Am, right, uh, 103. And also the Kegworth air disaster was still very much in the, you know, collective team consciousness. Um, and so, sort of, you know, we continued to, to sort of train for, um, yeah, major incidents sort of, sort of like that, or, you know, try and practice triage, for example you know even at a really basic level um 
to bring things back to um yeah you know the the, the kind of the outdoors or the, the sort of the kind of mountainous areas um south derby has got some really good rock climbing um yeah really good on the limestone cliffs around atlock um and this was a core you know it was a core area of our responsibility as a team um because the team's base was just in the north of derby so we used to practice technical rescues regularly doing big stretcher lowers down down these cliffs um which is which is all good fun um and really suited me as a climber but um um yeah it was all pretty intimidating stuff um so yeah i suppose that's a bit of a brief window into derby um yeah sorry yeah long answer to talk about edale um uh, you know it was quite different and yes i was a climber but i really needed to get to grips with the cas care um sort of stuff in particular so with a lot of the crags around um small cliffs and outcrops you know around haversage in the peak district and the limestone dales you know the nature of those incidents would be often sort of known location um you know you'd know the location the likely injuries and these incidents were you know they're uncomplicated by the need to search for people um people are nearly always at the bottom of a crag um can i can i talk a bit more about the cas care for a you minute? can yeah you can james yeah, yeah go right. for it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah sorry um yeah great thanks you know in my opinion I, I guess in some ways we're in a really privileged position in edale mrt sort of given our response times if you like so to get to most of the crags in our area that would be it would certainly be under 30 minutes from the road so um often as an individual kind of team member you know and people come from all different walks of life um you know you'd quite often be doing that initial medical care excuse me um so the vast majority of the team sort of held the mountain rescue um england and wales casualty care certificate and that's about level d or d or e on you know the, the faculty of pre-hospital care uh you know fem fem framework yeah um so you know where there might have been an element of sort of self triage on a remote scottish mountainside you know where a casualty unfortunately you know might die due to their injuries or survive despite the time taken to reach the scene um we'd often arrive where fundamental or basic kind of interventions really might make a difference so in many cases um the use of it you know airway adjuncts um bag valve mask to support ventilation um those sort of things could be undertaken by absolutely everybody in the team um, um and we're also really to have some experienced very supportive doctors paramedics and nurses you know different healthcare professionals um within the team who would often support um you know yeah you know the climbers and hill walkers amongst us basically doing the doing the cas care and they just kind of step in if there was a specific procedure that was required, you know, like cannulating or administering IV drugs or, um, and, you know, and that gave us some, many of us some really good hands-on experience. Um, and, and just to expand on that, you know, later as a, as a deputy team leader, the thing that stands out for me um, is the culture that we kind of fostered a team at the time was to do, the fundamentals well particularly with regard to things like uh, casualty packaging and you know ultimately we were dealing with predominantly with fit motivated people um you know who are active in the outdoors and you know we took pride in you know managing their pain and mobilizing limbs effectively and um, reducing the possibility of infection so that they could give the best possible um you know rehabilitation <coughs> So in practical terms, you know, reducing fractures, you know, using our antibiotics, splinting well, you know, was all um, everyday stuff. And um, and also, you know, air ambulances were, um, you know, very new in our area at the time. And we spent a lot of time behind the scenes trying to ensure that everybody knew 
each other's capabilities and most importantly that we could communicate together yeah <clears throat> so james around this time sort of your cogs must have been turning in the mountain rescue teams because you enrolled on a on a hemp course so a hazardous environment medical technician scheme with uh, <clears throat> arms could you maybe just speak to what you took away from this and and, and indeed what skill set it, it enabled yeah, certainly. Yeah, so after leaving Edale MRT, um, I was living in Chamonix um, in France, um, kind of hence the link to the uh, the Alps. And, um, and and of course, I couldn't maintain my um, mountain rescue uh, England and Wales casualty care certificate. Um, and I really wanted to do something beyond a kind of a standard two day first aid certificate. Um, and, you know, as a qualified mountain guide, the background to that is that, um, of course, we have a, a requirement to have a to maintain a first aid certificate. But the British Association of Mountain Guides, they're actually sort of fairly grown up in that, um, I would say, in that they require you, a, you require you to have a certificate or a qualification that's kind of commensurate with the environment that you're working in. So rather than having a set standard, so somebody working, a guide working in Antarctica, <clears throat> you know, is likely to have very different requirements to say somebody working in Chamonix where you might have a helicopter with a doctor on board in less than, well, certainly less than 10 minutes, you know. Um, and in the UK, you know, when I was doing that, most of the courses offered seemed to be geared either towards community first responders, you know, or, or kind of similar, um, or the, very much the kind of wilderness kind of environment and I guess Orms occupied that area where, you know, it was an EMT type, you know, standard broadly aligned to the old IHCD, you know, ambulance technician. Um, and it had a hazardous rather than wilderness sort of perspective to it. So, um, and, you know, and also at the time they were delivering training for um, UK SAR crews and doing other bits and pieces. Um um, which sounded interesting and, and for me it's just a great opportunity to sort of further myself and dip my toe perhaps into a more clinical course but you know without the commitment of making a wholesale career change you know. um so you know in terms of the scope of practice um yeah you know i wouldn't say it, it sort of necessarily expanded the scope of practice from cas care um, but it certainly covered things in more depth and um, and I suppose it started to encourage um, a bit more decision making, um, you know, intermediate life support, <coughs> um, uh, you know, capnography, use of LMAs, um, eye gels and um, other bits and pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, I suppose the other major element was the, the practice placements that were associated with that. So following the um, initial course, which is referred to as the intermediate or the IEC, um, I did some practice placements for a couple of weeks in, um, you know, the ED, emergency department, um, kind of operating theatres, um, which was superb. So I should thank the team in general in Sheffield. They know who they are. Yeah. Um, you know, I suppose one of the interesting things that I hadn't considered for this is that, you know, in medicine, people like to talk about austere environments, don't they? And um, and I learned that, you know, my comfortable environment is definitely a mountainside, you know, um, you know, a busy city ED or an operating theatre was definitely my austere environment. Yeah, I found it slightly uncomfortable. Um, interesting, though, it was. Um. And I did a, a couple of days, a few days on um, with Medic 54, Derbyshire and Leicestershire, um, Rutland's Air Ambulances, Critical Care Car. So, um, you know, you know how that works. Um, it was quite an eye opener for me. I think it would be fair to say. Um, and without doubt, you know, have the skills been useful? Um, I suppose, um, you know, yeah, that only really became apparent when i was first on scene at an avalanche incident um a little while later which involved um sort of you know multiple uh, multiple burials and uh, multiple casualties yeah so um you know the main challenges there were actually around um 
<coughs> excuse me, around triage and you know the hazards associated with the location. But um, certainly, having be having had some of those experiences before, um, yeah, it was extremely useful. Yeah. So, James, you spoke about your time with um, the MRTs and on the hemp course. Um, could you speak a bit more about your involvement with the British Mountaineering Council and the facets of work um, that you've been involved with? Yeah, um, yeah. So for three years, um, I delivered the British Mountaineering Council's winter safety lectures. So um, you sort of go on tour around the around the country um by well, england and wales um actually um so i went on tour with a colleague of mine neil johnson and um he, you know the aim of that is to sort of engage the public um many of whom are going to the winter mountains for the first time and of course it's a um a, a series of safety lectures um you know we or you don't have much time to cover a big subject and of course there's a range of user groups associated with that so um, it really forced us to think about, um, you know, perhaps where the greatest risks lie, if that makes sense, um, and how to communicate them effectively. Um, I'm probably still still working on that. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, I do remember showing a slide um, with you know, my colleagues and I in a position on Ben Nevis where we were exposed to avalanches from above you know, and talking about human factors and decision making um, and, and how that was really important in the winter. And somebody put their hand up and asked if I had any strategies for, you know, communi communicating effectively, teamwork, decision making in groups. And, and of course, I didn't really have a satisf satisfactory answer. So, um, you know, but it precipitated a lot of, um, you know, my own personal research into human factors in the mountains in, and, and how we might learn from other sectors in um such that kind of I hope to finish a, a PG cert in in applied psychology um and sort of can, can contribute to some research to sort of mountain guides behaviour. So yeah. So James, just looking at your uh time in the Alps and indeed your time in the Cairngorms, the, the geography is extremely different um from both the alps and the cairngorms but nonetheless probably um none the less more hazardous maybe sometimes in 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 the scottish uh in the scottish highlands could you maybe speak to sort of both environments um I, certainly when i've been in the scottish highlands i've underestimated the extremity of sometimes <laughs> the conditions and or, and or weather when it's uh, when it's turned nasty but could you maybe speak to sort of the 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 differentiator between the terrains and indeed what each environment uniquely brings um yeah yeah i can so i mean i guess you know with regard to mountain rescue you know my experience you know is predominantly uk based um you know but most of my work these days is sort of framed by that uk rescue experience um i now live in the cairngorms where previously i was full-time in chamonix um and i often explain the differences um in quite childlike terms <laughs> I think, because it helps me. But, you know, I consider the out of the Cairngorms to be, you know, pretty rolling. Uh, and uh, I do consider them uh, remote. And they're certainly subject to some pretty extreme weather. You know, the Cairngorm Plateau is, you know, the day that I am not sort of concerned navigating around there on my own, I think is the day to, to sort of retire and kind of hang up a map and compass and stuff. Um, it's an intimidating place and particularly... In winds from a certain direction, particularly with southerly winds, it can be pretty infernal up there. It's 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 pretty full on. Um, on the on the other hand, you know, of course, it has this extreme weather. It's pretty pointy. I, w I would say, you know, a kind of generally pointy piece. Of course, it's glaciated, and there's all the issues associated with that kind of glaciers, seracs, and the objective hazards. Um, and of course, the altitude is very, very different. So, you know, Mont Blanc, there in the Mont Blanc Massive, 4,810 metres. Um, and of course, a lot of summits above 4,000 metres. So um, I don't 
really think of it as as kind of remote in quite the same way due to the the infrastructure the ski infrastructure there. um uh, but I, but i should say you know of course if you take that infrastructure away for a second um you know for whatever reason bad weather it, it you know correspondingly the distances involved mean that it's, it's a pretty remote place um and help isn't close at hand and of course there's more to the alps than just chamonix and um, of course that's where i have to um to base myself but um yeah so you're talking about the diversity of of the geography there um and also in the alps you've got the altitude and the different weathers as well there could you talk about how technical rescues can be in this environment for example the larger teams the rope access crampon use and the kazavak stretchers as well as the um aeromedical considerations um that all go with that um yeah i mean hopefully i can give a bit of a window into that um you know it it probably makes sense for me to talk again obviously mostly about chamonix um uh, and as I hinted at before, I, I guess it isn't representative of, of the Alps as a whole. You know, we're very, really fortunate that the rescue services in Chamonix, are, um, you know, the PJHM are really well known. So uh, for being very good at what they do, um, you know, these days, the vast majority of rescues are done by um, helicopters, either those of Security Seville or um, the Gendarmerie with um you know uh, the rescuers are from the the pghm the high mountain police um so you know when you speak to the pghm i guess they describe they're described now um you know a, a kind of huge difference in the rescues now that they use helicopters to to perhaps sort of back in the day when everything was done on was done on foot and and i'm led to believe and i, I was trying to find a reference from it that there were a lot of um kind of altitude related problems and fatalities on mont blanc um you know much more than there are now kind of prior to that infrastructure and those uh, the kind of you know helicopter rescue being widely available um you know in terms of the technicality of the rescues um the interesting thing is that i'm told that in the vast majority of places mont blanc massive they can they can winch um using the the helicopters even if they use quite long cable uh, a lot of cable because the strata of the granite is often just off vertical so they get plenty of rotor clearance and and so for it is for that reason that they don't carry out sort of long line rescues that you might see in the us or kind of elsewhere in europe um so there is one notable exception to that and that's the north face of of the drew um, which has an overhanging terrain above there, an area called the niche. But um, for locations like that, they're more complicated. They would land people on the mountain and carry out some sort of technical rope rescue or cable rescue in them and then lift them off, you know, um, which which is interesting. I think the, the initial perception is that it's all done by a sort of long line, you know. Um, the nature of the rescues um you know more recently has changed given um the aircraft have changed so um for a long time they use the alouette <coughs> um alouette three um in chamonix um and certainly when you know i was rescued off the north face of of, of le Doitz, you know as a young young alpinist the aircraft that um uh, that they used you know which was was pretty dated then um and of course the, the move to the the EC one four five, which loads of people are sort of familiar with, and they they're now moving to. This is a bit geeky. They're moving to a new version that has five, you know, five ba five uh, bladed sort of design, which I'm led to believe is better performance at altitude. Um, for for those people who have really fancy chalets in Chamonix, um, they're also really pleased because it's much quieter. Um, when it when it goes over so there's on the way to the hospital there's much less disturbance you know um i guess despite um the use of helicopters that you know there's still some really impressive rescues conducted um on foot every year particularly on mont blanc um and of course they require sort of larger teams and um you know interestingly i saw one case um 
<coughs> excuse me, you know, not so long ago. And, um, you know, the weather was so bad that instead of kind of navigating up and down Mont Blanc, they'd used, um, they'd used marker ones to, um, you know, just kind of poles with flags on to, to mark the track in to find the casualty and then they could follow it, um, follow the flags and collect them on the way, on the way back. Um, you know, which is kind of pretty basic stuff, but you know, that's just how wild the weather, the weather was at altitude. Um, you know, avalanche rescue is, you know, another area that sort of requires, um, much bigger teams. And, and I guess it's worth noting that, um, you know, here, the, the role of mountain guides and ski instructors in France, you know, the role they play in the process is really important. So, um, you know, in France, as a professional working on the hill, um, you're required to stop and give assistance. And, and certainly in the case of an avalanche rescue near, near a ski area, um, you could be requested to assist, which which sort of makes sense for that rescue effort um, because it benefits from people comfortable with that environment and with a known kind of skill set and, and normally guides and ski instructors folk like that there you know they normally sort of bang up for getting stuck stuck in really yeah so james have you ever been caught out by the weather either during a rescue or indeed whilst you're out in the uh, out in the mountains um yeah yeah i mean good good question this i mean i'm not sure whether i have um yeah, where they have nested out in a rescue. Um, but of course, rescues often take place in bad weather generally, particularly in the UK. To sort of pivot that question just a little bit, um, I would say that the avalanche incident that I met, mentioned previously, you know, that was hampered by extreme weather for sure. Um, helicopters couldn't get to the scene. The rescue team had to come in by foot. Um, and, you know, we were in an avalanche kind of path in deteriorating weather so we could stay there for a time but there was a point where the risk was in was going to increase again and we had to move the remaining casualty from the from the scene to a place of safety which of course is really back to basics isn't it it's the sort of thing that you you kind of talk about on first aid courses but um you know seldom have a sort of needed to do um um yeah, you know, have I been caught out in bad weather myself? Um, yeah, you know, without a doubt. And, and I think can think of two things. Um, as a young climber, I've been caught out in bad weather going up to altitude to acclimatise because, uh, you know, because I wanted to get used to the altitude. I got stuck in bad weather in a hot and I ended up with uh, pulmonary um, edema, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. Um, and then... You know, and, and I guess from a work perspective, um, you know, or a personal perspective, I guess another occasion was going ski touring. And if I mention the location, I mean, it may be familiar to some people, but that was crossing from the Dies Hut over a mountain called the, the Pinda Roller in Switzerland and going down to the vignettes. And I set off in a, in a deteriorating forecast day. And in fact, the guardian of the hut had been you know, we knew that weather was coming. He'd given us an early breakfast and we'd set off early with plenty of time. Um, I had a situation where um, actually I was roped up and one of my clients punched through a crevasse, which it wasn't um, in itself uh, an issue because we could kind of extract him. But um, whilst that was, while that was dealt with, we got overtaken by the bad weather and then we had... Um, you know, that delayed us and it and it was quite a difficult and challenging descent down to the vignettes hut. And the um um and I suppose um yeah, I mean a couple of years later, it's a very powerful um description of another guy being in that situation, um and um or a, a not dissimilar situation in the same location and um and and um, most of the group kind of perishing in, in, in bad weather. And there's an article um, in Outside magazine which, which describes that situation. Maybe kind of put it in the show notes. It's, um, it's a pretty challenging read, yeah. Um, yeah, and then, you know, weather-wise, 
Um, yeah, you know, in the Alps generally, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, the vast majority or the greatest proportion of incidents are, you know, they're from falls um, and people getting stuck or crag fast is around 22%. Um, and, and again, I've got a link for that sort of those sort of stats, but those stuck or, or blocked sort of mountaineers, as they call them, excuse me, in French. Um, you know, they're often associated with quite challenging weather conditions, altitude. Um, and, I, and I get the impression that a significant proportion of those um, people are just caught out in bad weather. Yeah. So earlier you spoke about um, that story with the avalanche. Um, so with regards to avalanche risk, uh, for those people that don't really know much about it, what are the systems and scales in place to warn you and others of that risk. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so, you know, across um, <clears throat> across Europe generally, um, so we have a network of really good avalanche warning services um, in Europe. They're collectively known as, um, and um, all those services use a standard avalanche danger scale which is one to five or, or properly low uh, medium considerable high and very high or extreme um excuse me <coughs> um it's fairly broad brush stroke um because that scale is designed to cope with um to describe everything from you know the effect on an individual through to infrastructure so levels four and five would be um you know big avalanches to the valley valley floor that might affect lift infrastructure or roads or or, or other things so um you know in terms of the individual um you know even operating in that one or certainly up to three um up to that considerable low medium considerable um you know needs careful consideration so you know to support that you know that scale is one thing and um we you know we've talked about on a web webinar before i think um about the avalanche problems and how the forecast works um but you know ultimately you can't forecast an avalanche with certainty so you can't say it's going to avalanche over there today in this time frame but what we can say is that you know these are the conditions that favor you know, an avalanche release. And, and of course, those can be in places they can be observed. So, you know, it really requires sort of planning, planning and management of the task by by the individual and they need to, to kind of buy into that a little bit. Um, and it, so, of course, that risk in terms of avalanche risk, that comes for our interaction with the hazard. Um, so we need to know uh, where to go, and where not to go. That's essential. Um, one of the really good services for professionals in France is provided not by the forecasting service, but another uh, group of guys um, collectively uh, known as Data Avalanche. And they send out an email alert um, when there's significant precipitation or wind, um, you know, when that's expected. It's, it's a really simple sort of push of information, um, but it gives you a bit of a pause sometimes while you're planning um, you know, planning what you're going to do the next day, for example. So, James, just looking at your approach to cold injury in the Alps, what are some of the principles that you abide by when you're rewarming patients? Uh, yeah, I'm going to try not to be too flippant here, but I would say phone Chris Imray, <laughs> well, Professor Chris Imray, I should say. Um, yeah, I mean, seriously, you know, kind of phoning a friend in this sort of situation is really valuable um, for me. And um, and I, I'm not sort of shy in doing that. Um, you know, as a mountain guide, my role, you know, at the moment is, is to be really vigilant and try and ensure that people are adequately hydrated. You know, they're well fed and they're protected uh, from the elements. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that's not to, to sort of be a bit of a cop out, um, really, but, you know, I've been thinking about this all this last week in Chamonix, working in Chamonix, where temperatures have been you know, minus 15 to minus 19 on one occasion. Um, I've been fortunate in that I think I've only seen one significant 
frostbite case and that was on Amadablam to a member of another expedition um and, and my understanding currently is that you know other than warming up slowly um you know making sure that it doesn't freeze you know there's no freezing of that flesh sort of you know again and um, you know speaking to a medical professional early um i see that really important and particularly if it might facilitate access to um you know using a vasodilator or a, you know an iloprost or something like that which is pretty i believe is coming pretty standard now um and we're really fortunate in the uk to have that uk sort of frostbite service via um some holders of the you know those who hold a diploma in mountain medicine um, and within the guides with the british mountain guides we um and we've got a medical advisor as well so yeah i'd be picking up the phone as soon as possible i think so you've spoken before about altitude um being a factor within this environment what is your approach mm -hmm. to altitude sickness yeah um yeah they need to go down <laughs> um and yeah again i mean of course we i suppose we, you know we kind of need to consider the kind of circumstances around that particular case don't we um you know in my case in the um kind of trapped in the hut of course i say that but i wasn't in a position to go down it was, it was sort of three days before i was able to do that um yeah um obviously descent's really important um you know again within within sort of you know mountain guiding it's kind of pretty common um for guides to to sort of carry um you know altitude related drugs for um for use with kind of hape and hape and haze um you know if they're going to those sort of altitude environments um yeah that's very common um you know we'd normally operate with a, a sort of a checklist for, for for kind of doing that sort of um you know kind of giving those drugs independently but but also but you know in the alps and chamonix um it works kind of slightly differently because again normally you could the chances are you'd be able to get a doctor on the phone so effectively you'd be able to speak to the doc the pghm doctor and it'd be normal for, for guys to carry those things but effectively the the um you know the doctor you would would sort of prescribe that by proxy if you like so um you know you've got it but they would it would be on their on their advice so um that's quite common to to be able to phone doctors for that advice um or, or equally to use a hut um you know all the huts have sat phones and radios and certainly the highest huts you know it's common for them to have oxygen um you know those out access to those altitude drugs and um um you know an, an, an aed as you know as a minimum yeah so james as we come into land on the conversation could you maybe speak to a seminal case you've been involved with um that maybe just reinforces some of the balls you've spoken about in the interview i know you spoke about earlier around doing the basics well and tacit execution of the basics could you could you maybe speak to a, a case um yeah certainly um and uh, i mean i'm not sure whether um seminal case i suppose what, what you know what i can do is, is, is perhaps talk about kind of common common cases they're the ones that kind of spring immediately to mind and the first one would be you know working in recent years would be would be that of, of sort of crevasse um a crevasse rescue um and of course the challenges around that are you know not only <clears throat> um I suppose the medical kind of side of it but the you know the, the kind of rescue the rescue effort as well um so um yeah you know firstly you know people you know and we're terrible for it mountain guides you know we kind of talk about um you know doing a crevasse rescue and it's like this and you use these ropes and you pull somebody out and that's fine and of course in the vast majority of cases those people are injured um, at the very least they're cold and and they probably need you know they probably need to to be removed to a place of safety so um those are things to to kind of consider um to to think of one um you know specifically w would be um you know the valley blanche which you know really for those people who who don't know really popular off ski off piste ski run um or high mountain off piece you know, there's no markers or um 
you know, or navigation um, kind of aids off the top of the Agreed Amidi and it runs all the way down a big high altitude glacier and goes down into, into Chamonix. Um, so it's really common on, on that particular one. There are lots of crevasses, excuse me, and um, there are lots of crevasses. You manoeuvre, inevitably you manoeuvre around them, but particularly when there's fresh snow, is uh, I might set one line and then, or another party, and then gradually, because people want to ski fresh snow and get, um, you know, kind of fresh turns in, they push the track a little bit wider, a little bit wider, and somebody will go in. And and in the winter, um, you know, that happens with some kind of frequency. So, um, you know, the last time that happened to me, um, it was somebody in another party who was behind me and um you know somebody in my party shouted they'd they'd gone in um and of course not witnessing it myself i i probably i didn't really totally believe it um but they pointed to this hole and um and of course i had to go and have a look in it so that means um you know creating an anchor going to the edge um before i can even establish whether anybody's in there um the person who was in there was approximately sort of 20 maybe 27 28 meters down something like that because i'd got a 30 meter rope so i could throw them a rope to think about the basics to to make them to make them safe and um, attach them onto the rope but i had very little very little left to, with which to effect a rescue and they were clearly stuck from what they were saying and they were injured so of course in that respect, it's relatively straightforward that you're going to call call a rescue. Um, so, in terms of the you know the medical intervention, there is probably it's probably pretty minimal. Um, but they've fallen a kind of a huge distance, and you need to consider sort of the mechanism of injury, and, and of course they're going to need a rescue. So, the challenges there were um, um, were you know as the as the helicopter kind of comes into the glacier. Um, there's um, obviously there's other crevasses around that's quite a dangerous part of the process and um there is a procedure that you know most guides are kind of taught um to to sort of help the rescue services on the ground so that means kind of probing an area with an avalanche probe to make sure there's no more crevasses it means rigging the rope um in a particular loop so that um so that when the um the, the, the securitists, you know, the crew come out of the aircraft, they can clip straight into a rope um, and wander around on the, on the glacier, which is all basic stuff. But all that needed to be done prior to really doing any, any CAS care. And of course, when the casualty came out there, yeah, they've fallen a significant distance. You know, they're in a vac mat and, and really, you know, in Chamonix, they're off, um, you know, they're off to hospital kind of first where they can be as properly assessed in a sort of a warm environment yeah um so yeah i don't know does that go some way to i suppose describing a common one um Owen, and it, i mean of course the other thing working in the outdoors i mean i suppose um or being in the outdoors, you know a lot of injuries would be probably be lower leg and knee and, and knee injuries you know just like in the uk you know whether it's from skiing or walking um, rather than avalanche or Karaserak fall or, or kind of some of these other things. So, um, you know, there's still significant, I suppose, there's still significant injuries, for, for, but, um, you know, they are common. So kind of splinting um, these things and, um, you know, kind of checking, yeah, checking pulses below the site of the injury and stuff like that is, is pretty common. Yeah. James, listen, that's fantastic. And we'll put that um, that case study in the show notes that you were speaking to earlier. Uh, indeed, um, any of the empirical literature that you've mentioned within the interview, we'll put, we'll put in the show notes um, as well as other resources. Uh, but listen, I just want to say thank you from myself and indeed Lauren um, for both a fascinating and insightful interview uh built on a lot of anecdotal experience and and indeed uh, education in, in the past so so thank you from us uh james um, and it's been absolutely fascinating yeah brilliant no thank you thank you nice to nice to join you that's um yeah superb yeah nice to meet you lauren yeah nice cheers, to meet you. thank you
Thanks for listening to the episode. Please feel free to rate, review and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical and performance medicine. Thanks again.